like Matt said, make files are extremely useful in a wide variety of situations, not all just traditional, I have a big software project and I need to compile it type situations. Um, yeah, we use make files for our LaTeX stuff all the time. Um, and if you're using like a LaTeX GUI that automatically will make your LaTeX files for you, there is a semi-decent chance that it's using make behind the scenes uh, to do all of its magic for you. Um, but we'll look at a real simple example that doesn't actually involve compiling anything. So just so we're all starting from a common place, why don't you guys just make a temporary directory that's empty and we'll do all of our work inside there. Uh, so I'll just call mine make test, but I don't care what you call it. Just make it, CD into it, so you're sitting in an empty directory. Um, and this way, when we make a mistake, we don't do too much. So the convention is always to name your make file, make file with a capital M. Uh, you can actually, there's a hierarchy here that it, when you call make, it searches the current directory for a file of this name. If it doesn't find this, it searches for the same thing with a lowercase m. If it then has a few other options, it searches. But this is what you should use because this is the most standard, even though there are some other things that will actually work. Um, so we just open that, and it's just going to be an empty file right now. And the way a make file works is uh, it's kind of like a bash script. Um, a lot of things you can do in Bash script you can do in here with a few limitations, uh, but it has more of this dependency base. I mean, the way to think about it is it's a way to write recipes for building files, recipes for creating files. Um, so you can have things like, and, and we won't, maybe we'll add these in a minute, but you can have things like variables. Often you open make file, you'll see at the top like you would in a Bash program, just a whole bunch of variables that are set up. We'll skip that for now. And what we're going to do is just a very simple make file that um, we'll start with it depending on nothing. So the way a make file is formatted, you have what's other than maybe you have some extra like variables and stuff at the top, but the core part of the make file consists of what we call a series of targets, where a target is always the name of what we're going to create, followed by a colon, followed by whatever dependencies this has. Uh, we'll start with a file that has no dependencies. So we're just going to say we're writing a make file that's going to spit out a file called my file when it's done. We run make, we'll go from an empty directory to an empty directory that contains, or to a directory that contains my file. Jump in if I do something stupid here, by the way. Um, so we have on this line the name of our target, a colon. We would list any dependencies here. This is not going to pinpoint anything, so we just leave this blank. Then we go down one line, and then you have to put a tab. So you need to hit tab. Uh, make is one of those, so a lot of programs don't care whether you use tabs or you use a series of spaces. Make does care. If you try to put a bunch of spaces here, this won't work. You need an actual tab character here. Uh, and that's why Emacs highlights it in purple for me, because Emacs has a make file mode. It's doing special color coding because it knows that I'm working on a make file. Uh, but anyway, what you then type down here is on one command per line, you type all the commands that need to run to create this file. So often, I mean, we're not actually going to compile anything, but often this would like be GCC, so on and so forth. In our case, we're going to do the simplest thing possible. We're just going to call touch, which creates an empty file, and then we want to name it my file. So, I mean, we're basically writing a make file that does what touch does. But this make file is saying, I need to generate my file. The way I make the recipe to generate my file is to call touch my file, and that's it. So are people kind of with me? I'm going to get rid of some of the empty space at the top. Okay, so if we close this, so we'll see in our folder right now all we have is our make file, which is fine. The make file itself, although it's kind of like a script, it doesn't actually need to be executable because we're not calling it. You, you never call a make file directly like you would a bash script. You never do this. Uh, it doesn't have that sha bang at the top. It doesn't have the extra machinery there. You can actually do a shabang make at the top, which you sometimes see, but don't do that. Um, instead, we just call the make program, and the make program knows, like I said, it will locate something called a make file in the current directory if it can find it, and it will go ahead and do it. So if we just run make with no options, uh, it's going to try to make the first target in our make file. There's only one target in our make file, so it's going to run that. If we do make, it's going to print out the one command it ran. And if we do an ls, we'll see we now have my file in here too. Now, one of the beauties of make, and part of the reason it has this target dependency format, is it doesn't redo things that it doesn't have to do. So we already have a file called my file. If we run make a second time, 
you'll notice we just get this message that my file is already up to date and it doesn't do anything. My file has no dependencies, so if it doesn't depend on anything and it already exists, make me knows that what it's going to get is the same thing it got before and there's no reason to run touch again. It's just going to keep what it got before. Uh, this can be helpful if you have something that takes hours to compile. Make allows you to kind of compile the bare minimum of things that actually need change, that have actually changed. So if we get a little bit more complicated, are people kind of understanding what's happening thus far? Okay. So if we get a little bit more complicated, we'll kind of file. Can, well, let's let's follow a convention here. So there's two targets that you almost always expect to have in a make file, just by convention. The first one is called all. So all by default just builds any files that are just calls any targets that you need to call normally. In this case, we just have one target. So we're going to make all depend upon my file. So where this matches the name on the left hand side over here. So now when we do make, it's going to by default and all is almost always the first target because that's what you want to get called. When you just type make, it always it's like calling make on whatever the first thing here is. So now when we call make, it's going to do the same thing it did before, but it's a little bit more by convention. So it's going to do, I need to make this all. It's going to go, well, before I can make all, I have to make any of my dependencies. So it's going to go, well, I, don't, I need to make my file if it doesn't already exist. Come down here, do a touch my file. Then we're not actually going to put anything in the body of all. There's nothing, you don't have to have anything in the body. Um, all is what we're going to call a foamy target. It just calls basically all of its dependencies. The other target you almost always have in a make file is called clean. What clean does, clean should call whatever code is necessary to undo everything that all did. So in this case, clean almost never has any dependencies, but what we're going to want to do is delete my file. And we're actually going to do a rm-f. What the dash f will do is it basically, if my file doesn't exist, it, and you have a dash f, it won't throw an error. Um, so we've added two more targets now, all, which just calls the one target we already had, and clean, which has no dependencies, but when we run make clean, it's going to delete anything that was generated by all this my file file. Make sense? So if we close out of the make file now, so if we do make again, now it's going to call the all target, but again, there's nothing to be done, because all only depends upon one thing. It depends upon my file, and my file already exists. But if we do a make, so if you call make with an argument after it, this is an argument. This is just this can be the name of any of the targets in the make file. So make with nothing after it always calls the first target, which if your make file is following convention, should be the same as make all. So make and make all should always do the same thing. But now we want to call the clean target. So we're going to type in make clean. That's going to run the RM. If we do an ls now, we'll notice we're back to where we started. It deleted the one file we auto generated. If we do make again, it'll now recreate it. It's back. Make a second time. It's still there. Make clean again. It's gone. Make sense? OK, so let's maybe get even a little bit more complicated. Uh, so make, well, let me just look at it real quick. Uh, the man page probably isn't the best place to go. but. Um, Make like bash is one of those things that you could has a manual about an inch thick if you really want to learn all of the cleverness that it can do. Um, so what you're seeing here is kind of the very bare minimum of the cleverness it can do. Uh, it's capable of supporting. Close to here. Uh, to roll their table by. Um, so make can actually do clever things like. Instead of specifying specific files, you can specify like a pattern matching. So you could write a make file to convert all of your MP3 files to, I don't know, a different bit rate of MP3 or to FLAC or to some other audio format. You wouldn't want, if you have 100 MP3 files, you don't want to write a separate make target for each one. So instead, make has a way where you can just do anything, basically like a star.mp3, and in order to get that, you then call this file, this program on each file. So there's a lot of cleverness that it can do that we're not actually going to get into. Uh, but we will look at a few of the other features. Um, so let's go ahead and define another target. So we'll call this one my file too. And we'll do the same thing. 
Yeah. Oh, okay. That's not a bad idea. Um, so my file two is just going to be a copy of my file. So we'll do cp my file. But we have an issue, which is right now if we go to make my file two and my file doesn't already exist, this is going to throw an error, right? It's going to say it can't copy it. So this is what a make file exists to fix. We have to let my file too know that it depends on my file. My file needs to exist before it tries to run any of these commands. So right here, we will list my file as a dependency. Then we're going to come up here to all, and we're actually going to change the default build. We're just going to have it make my file too by default. And in the process of making my file too, it should automatically build my file for us. Where's it copying my file too? Uh, so that's a good point. So this needs to have a second, like so. Yeah, uh, there are always exceptions to this rule, but in general, if all of your dependencies and all of your targets don't appear somewhere inside your rule, you've probably done something wrong. Uh, not hard and fast. You can actually list multiple targets up here. Maybe for fun, we'll do that. So we'll make another one called my other file. And we'll just do the same thing with it. Touch my other file. And we can then make this depend upon both of them. And maybe instead of CPing them, we'll cap them. So we'll take those two files, combine them, and save the output to the output file. So we're going to cat my file, my other file, and we're going to pipe the output to my file too. People clear what we just did? So we're never actually going to call these directly, but we're going to call make. By default, it's going to run all. All is going to say, I need to do my file too. It's going to jump down to here. It's going to say, oh, I want to do my file too. But before I can run this, I have to make sure both of these files exist. And it's going to come up here and say, OK, I need my file. Here's how I get my file. I need my other file. Here's how I get my other file. Now I'm good. Now I can run this cat command. Now I'm done. Make sense? We need to update one other thing. We're going to have make clean remove all of these files. Oh. Yeah. Oh, can you just. Oh, never mind. Oh, I still still there. Okay. Oh, I just... So I just added two more lines to the clean command just to remove the two other files that I'm now creating at some point. People good? Yeah. So if we close this. We'll start off with the make clean just to get rid of anything. So if we look, I'm going to remove that. So this tilde file, Emacs, whenever you save a file in Emacs, it spits out the old version of the file with a tilde after it. It's just like a little backup mechanism. Um, I'm going to remove that just because I don't like looking at it. So we have an empty folder with nothing but our make file in it. If we do make, oh, and I screwed something up. Probably because I spelled wrong. OK, so it helps if you spell things correctly. So let's try that again. We have an empty directory. I'm going to run make. And we'll see make actually called three commands. It called touch my file, touch my other file, and then it called the actual command that it needed. These commands just got called automatically because they were in the dependency list. So if we do ls, we'll see right now we have all three files. I can do a make clean again. We're back to no files. Sometimes it's useful to just build an intermediate file. So you can do that just by calling that directly. So if I just want my file or just my other file, I can just call make on my file, and it'll run whatever it needs to make that file. People clear on kind of what make can do? So. As you can see, this starts to become a pretty powerful mechanism. Uh, you can use it to do a lot of cleverness with this. If you think about every file in terms of the recipe that generates it, or at least everything. So you're going to have your core set of files that you wrote by hand. But everything above that, you should be able to build as a combination of a recipe of commands that does some kind of actions on those core files you touch directly, and then automatically generates some other files. And then maybe you have even more files that get automatically generated off those. So you can kind of start to build these hierarchy trees that can turn into make files that can do some pretty powerful things. Just real quick, I'll show it because there's a whole bunch of these built in. So right now we're doing rm-f. Uh, 
This is super common in a make file because you always have a clean target and you always need to do rm-f. So make actually has a series of built-in variables, uh, just like a, kind of like a bash script would, that you can always call. So just like in a bash script to access a variable in a make file, you do a uh, dollar sign, then you do colon, and then you type the name of the variable. So bash has a built-in rm variable that resolves to lowercase rm-f. So this just saves us having to type that extra dash f. And this is how you'll normally see it written. Uh, if you pull up the make manual, there's a whole bunch of these uh, for, a, for a lot of simple commands that need extra flags that you often add in a make file. There's a lot of built-in versions. Um, What's a comment delimiter for a make file? Uh, it is a... No, it's a pound. Oh, is it a pound? It's for wild cards. I was doing something earlier. Oh, LaTeX. It's a, a pound. Yeah. Yep. So it's just like bash. It's a pound. LaTeX. It's a. Yeah, it's a percent sign. You should do like instead of my file to do a dollar pound. Okay. So, so let's uh let's just run this real quick just to prove that it works. So I'm gonna do a make clean, and you'll see. So. It's still running the same command we had before, that dollar sign $rm is just turning into this, but uh, that's how it's often written. And so it seems kind of trivial that the reason why you might want to use the rm variable over rm itself is because you might want to run clean without the dash f, and so you can run the whole make file and just in one place redefine rm. Right, so rm is defined by default, but if we wanted to so if we wanted to define basically, if instead of having rm-f, like Matt was saying, if we just wanted to run rm, we could basically redefine rm up here, and then it would override the default version of rm with our version up here. Um, the other reason you do this is to help make your make files platform independent. So on Linux, rm-f does what we want, but if we're careful to do it like this, and in fact, really, we should be doing all of our commands with something like this. Um, some of them, but if you're just using built-in stuff like this, if I go to another machine where I need something other than rm-f, the make system on that machine is going to know what I need on that machine. If I just call rm and I don't override it, I'm going to get whatever the default for that machine is. rm is not a great example of that because rm is the same everywhere. The better example is, and you'll see this a lot, the cc variable, and this is not going to do anything. I just So you would normally have cc like instead of touch. But, but CC is the default C compiler on whatever system you have. So on this system, it's GCC, but if you're running on like a System 5 Unix install, it could be HPC compiler or something. Um, so you almost always see this as CC and here, which will call the default C compiler on the system. Uh, and then often, if you you'll, you will, sometimes you'll just, if you want to force a specific C compiler up here, you'll say CC equals GCC or something. Um, so maybe I'll just, so just so we have an example, I'll do touch equals touch, or maybe I'll just call it T. So now for instead of typing in touch a bunch of times, I can just do this. And that way if I decide instead of touch, if I want something different, I just have to change it in one place instead of having to change it in a whole bunch of places. So uh, let's just make sure we haven't broken anything. Okay, so we're still good. People still with me? So we can give it any name, right? Yeah, you can do you whatever you want. I mean, yeah, so the variable name can be anything. I mean, the, the what is the variable? So this could be any command. T with capital T. Uh, capital T, lowercase yeah. t. Yeah, so this could be my T, this could be whatever I want. You don't even actually need to capitalize it. By default, in a make file, your variables should always be all capitals, though. It just makes it more difficult. Yeah, uh, you're right. Unlike a bash script, this is legal. There's actually different types of, I mean, we won't get into this, but there's different types of equals. Some of these will, if t already has a value, it'll just append this to it. So if you have like t is a big list of files or something, uh, so the one you see real commonly, uh, well, it's not a good example here, but um, you'll see something called like build files. I'm not even capitalizing it. But then you could do something like my file two there, and then here you would just do 
I mean, you can use it like variables. And maybe we have another one that called like other files. And these are my file and my other file. And then down here in my clean command, I can just call So now it's very uh, So now just at the top of my make file, I can kind of define everything that's going to get cleaned and everything that's going to get built, and so on and so forth. And actually, I can replace it here too, right? So this can just become other files. Basically, the less kind of hard coded stuff you have in your make file, the better. Like have all stuff that's specific to you, define it as a variable on top. So it's, it's still doing the exact same thing we did before, but it's starting to become a slightly better make file from terms of uh, long-term maintainability and stuff. The last thing we'll look at is there are some other automatic variables. Uh, the most common, so you can imagine it's really common to want to do some operation on the target of your rule here. So there is actually a variable that automatically refers back to the target of the current rule you're in. Um, I almost always have to look this up. Is this a hat? Oh, it's this hat. So these don't have uh, don't have parentheses like the other ones do, but get at always refers to the target yourself. So we can actually replace in both of these cases, we can actually make both of these have the same rule. So you can see by doing stuff like this, this is how you start to be able to do powerful things if you just have this match like a specific pattern. So now if this is just matching any MP3 file, then you can you don't need to know the name of every MP3 file. You can just deal with whatever one it's currently on, and so on and so forth. It's also a little bit cleaner. The other one, there's another variable that refers to the list of all your dependencies. So like right here, I can do all my dependencies. Is that hat? Yeah. So the at means whatever my target is, the hat means whatever my list of dependencies are. There's other variables that always mean my first dependency, my last dependency, the dependencies in the middle, which is sometimes handy if you need to like treat one dependency differently than you need to treat other ones, and that comes in play in compiling. Uh, you can look these all up, like I said, in the manual. So the, the dollar at refers to the target? Yes. yes. The dollar at's the target, the dollar hat is the list of however, the, everything that's after the poll. Question. How does it know about the dependencies? Well, so I'm specifying them, right? Just in the. So I have a variable. Files. So I, that was the change I made a minute ago. So this other files variable is the two files that I'm counting together, right? Oh, okay. And then I'm listing those. So this variable is going to turn into my file, my other file. And then this variable is just going to grab whatever's there and insert it here. So if I run this now. It does the same thing it's been doing all along, but now it actually looks like what a lot of make files are going to look like when you encounter them. Um, I can so I can actually do I can do the full change here, right? So my file two is my target in this case, so I can replace it with color app. Questions? That's probably as deep of a dive into make files as we want to do. Oh, let me, one more thing. One gotcha. Though. Um, each of these lines is called by bash to run, like so it's, it's treated line by line separately. So you can't actually do a CD to another directory because basically it'll CD on this line and then that line will be done and it'll be back where you started. So um, it's, this is not like a bash script itself. You have to think of it line by line. Yeah, that's a good point. That does hit you every now and then. So if you need to run multiple commands that need to be run in the same context, like you need to CD somewhere and then run a command there, you need to separate them by semicolons all on one line. Um, generally, if you need to CD into another directory, there's some other make file patterns and tricks that you use to deal with that. But uh, yeah, each time you get to a new line, it's going to reset like to the environment of wherever you started. Um, so if you create any files, they'll all still be there. But you can't like assume that a CD on the previous line, you're still going to be in that directory when you hit the next line. You're going to be back in whatever directory the make file was originally. Is there a way to get around that where you 
set of a directory that you want and then to stay in that directory and work on all the stuff. Yeah. And then so there are ways. So you can give the make file a parameter that says like go to this directory and then start executing there. Um, you often like for big software projects, sometimes you have multiple make files where like each directory will have a make file that deals just in that directory, and then you have a top level directory that goes into each directory and calls make recursively within that directory. So it can get very complex. I mean, you can if you can imagine it, you can do it with make. The criticism of make is not that it can't do enough, it's that it can do too much. Uh, and thus it can be complicated and have a steep learning curve to get to some of the advanced stuff. There are other make-like systems. Uh, make is kind of the golden standard, but some people refuse to use it because it's so huge. People say it can be overly complicated. So I don't think I have it installed on here. So MK is like a lightweight make. So all the stuff we just did, I'm pretty sure also work in MK. Uh, some of the more advanced features that make supports, you can't do in some of these other systems. But make is the golden standard. It's what most people use. Uh, there are some lighter weight variants for people that object to make on philosophical grounds. Questions on make, make files, what they're useful for. So just real quick, as a quick example, I mean, we're not actually going to go into it too far. So just to show you guys what like a real make file would look like. I mean, so I actually have a couple of make files here. Um, so this is a program I'm writing for another class. And it actually has a make file somewhere in here that does a whole bunch of things. It compiles the code, then the make file like, runs a series of test cases. I mean, you can really do a lot in the make file. The one that's actually a little bit more interesting is there's also, this is actually a make file Matt wrote, and I subsequently modified and used over and over again. Which is why you want everything as variables, <laughs> because then it makes your stuff reusable. So this is my LaTeX make file. So, and like Matt was saying, if you have things nice to find variables at the top, every time I have a new LaTeX project, I just copy this make file in, change a few basic things at the top. Um, but so this project has a report that I'm working on with it, and this make file. So I don't want to read it. So it has some comments at the top, but then, yeah, it basically goes through. So here's all the commands I'm going to use. I mean, it calls bibtech to build a bibliography. It does automatic image conversion for me, so I can just dump images of any format into some folder, and then the make file will automatically convert them to whatever format LaTeX needs before LaTeX needs to include them. Um, and then it gets down here to things like, uh, so if I have my clean targets up at the top, but like if so proposal, if I need to generate my proposal, it starts with a PDF. The input to that PDF, PDF is the output of the first pass through LaTeX and the output of BibTeX. It then calls LaTeX to generate that first, that .aux. It looks at my tech file. and calls. So LaTeX is kind of confusing because it takes multiple passes to get to where you're going, which is why it's formatted like this. But this is the file I'm editing. Everything in the center is auto-generated. And then up at the top, I get my PDF, which is what I actually want at the end of the day. Oh, OK. So I'll just talk about that real quick. Um, so you'll see this dot phony target a lot. Uh, we didn't do this in our other make file. We should have. Anytime you have a target that doesn't actually produce any output, so all and clean were examples in our last one, uh, it's not that it doesn't have any commands. Uh, it's that it doesn't. it's a target that doesn't generate a file. So when we ran all, it wasn't like we were getting an all file. When we ran clean, it's not like we were getting a clean file. Um, it avoids some subtle issues that can happen down the road if you tell LaTeX if you just give it a list of any of the special targets you have that don't actually generate a file, and that's what the dot phony does. So you would do dot phony colon, and then do you have it up here multiple times? Because really, yeah, you can have multiple. And yeah, so the okay. main reason for it is, let's say you have a target named clean, you want that to run no matter what. But let's say you accidentally make a file named clean. Now you type make clean, and make says, oh, I don't need to make clean anymore because the file's there. So making a dot phony target just says it's it's a target to be run unconditionally. So this is the line you'll almost always see is you'll have, so all is always a phony target, clean is always a phony target. In this LaTeX file we have a second clean that's a clean all where clean gets rid of all the intermediate files, clean all gets rid of the intermediate files and the actual PDF itself. So again this is kind of LaTeX specific. But uh, I mean you can use make files for everything from compiling your reports to compiling your code to 
I've had make files just exist to do clever things like copy things to certain directories after I have another script download them and stuff like that. Um, so it, it becomes a very powerful motif. Uh, it's worth at least knowing that it exists if nothing else, but it is something that you'll tend to find uses for if you start to think in that mentality. And it can save you lots of time. I mean, anytime you're in a situation where you have some output files that are always generated from some input files, you should start thinking maybe a make file is the best way to deal with this. Be it image conversion, be it data conversion, be it code, be it LaTeX, so on and so forth. Questions? Okay. So that kind of covers the bulk of, I mean, what you have to touch in the build chain without turning this into a programming class. Um, so you saw how to build things from source, you kind of saw the main parts of the system, your compiler, uh, make, uh, configure, some of these things that sit above make, and then we looked at some detail in what you can actually do with a make file directly. So next week, what we're kind of kind of be doing, it'll be, I mean, if people have things that they want covered that they don't think we've covered, so we're not next week, Thursday, Thursday's our last class, so by all means email us if you think there's some giant gap that we haven't touched on. But what we're planning on doing next week is filling in a few little holes of stuff that we skipped or ran out of time for thus far, and then just kind of taking a look at some of the other big software that you often use in Linux. Um, some of these other programs that are just real inherent in a Linux environment that it's good to at least know they exist. So if you need to do image editing, you know what to look for. If you need to do MATLAB type stuff, you know what to look for. Um, Linux has a lot of open source equivalents for a lot of like for MS Office, for MATLAB, for a lot of this kind of closed source stuff that you may be used to using. So it's good to know what the Linux environment equivalent is, even though that has nothing to do with Linux itself, uh, and kind of how to use it and what it does. But we're also, if there's other stuff you want to cover, just send us an email. We'll stick around for a bit if people want to go over anything one-on-one -on -one or just have extra questions. Are there any just questions we should get out right now? All right. Thanks a lot.